okay. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's sort of uh, kind of cool to just okay. keep talking if you want. All right, we've got uh, attendees coming in. <clears throat> Welcome everybody uh, to the Focus on the Story Virtual International Festival webinar. We're gonna get started in about three more minutes. We'll give people a chance to get logged in. I didn't, uh, Facebook feed is on and I am uh, gonna slide into the background. Good luck y'all. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Great, yeah, I see it now, thanks. Lewis, where are you? I'm right here. No, I mean, where where are you physically? <laughs> oh, just, <laughs> sorry, I'm just out uh, in, in Maryland, just outside of Washington. Maryland. Okay, Rockland. great. And Thomas, you're in Maryland as well? I'm sorry? Thomas? No, no, I, I'm actually in Dallas, Texas. Okay. Where mm. We are okay. located, yes. That's great. And Alan, you said you're in um, uh, Hawaii right now? Yes. That's great. Oh, nice. Oh, you're in Kauai? Uh, in, in Honolulu. I'm, I'm oh, Honolulu. Oh, okay. I, I heard Not a bad there. place to be quarantined. No. Yeah. <laughs> but I heard Maui, they just... Um, uh, they uh, threw some people off the island, four people who came in who were supposed to do a 14 day quarantine and they decided yeah. to by the pool instead and they were all, you know, given, um, you know, basically given, given a fine, they were fined. And I think they were actually asked to, you know, or, or escorted off the, you know, to fly off the island. Yeah, we've oh, wow. been arresting a lot of people. Yeah. It's been a problem. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. You know, my wife's parents used to live out in Ka on Kauai, um, you know, over in Poipu, which uh, was, have you ever been out there? Do you live out there or are you? Uh... Uh, I live in New York typically, but I'm, I'm from here. So I've been uh, quarantining with my, my parents as this stuff. Oh, <laughs> not so bad. <laughs> but we, we've, we've spent a lot of time out there just because of my wife's parents and over the years and really came to love it a lot. Yeah, it's beautiful out there. Yeah. Okay, about, uh, we'll give it about uh, another 45 seconds and then we'll get started. Uh, just to let you know, we've the number we've got 156 and counting it keeps uh oh, wow. Just, yeah wow. from yeah. Curacao, we're from all over the place yeah from all over the place yeah 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 it's great and this is a hot topic right now yeah, yeah. i saw one from france somebody's from france is online mm -hmm. yeah i think it's from all over the world which is fantastic yeah yeah Okay, let's get started. Welcome everybody uh, to Focus on the Stories uh, Virtual International Photo Festival. Uh, the webinar today is on Instagram, copyright, and you. Can photographers protect their copyright and use social media? We've got an excellent panel today. We've got two legal experts. We've got photographers. We've got um, uh, everybody that you would need to talk to to get information about this topic. Um, before, so while we uh, get ready to dive in and people are still logging in, uh, I'd like to ask you to send any questions you have um, to the Q&A box that's at the um, 
on the, the bar. Most likely it's at the bottom of your screen. There's a Q&A box. So you can use the chat box to chat with um, the panelists. Uh, you know, if you have technical questions or want to ask something, but if you have a question for the panelists, um, please try to move those to the Q&A box so we can make sure that we see those um, during the Q&A time. We'll have plenty of time for that. So uh, we're looking forward to getting those questions from you. I want to introduce our moderator um, today. Where it's um, really excited to introduce Jerice May. She's a photographer, um, a visual storyteller based in the Washington D.C. area. She's also the current president of the um, Women Photojournalists of Washington (WAPA), which is a membership organization with over 250 female photojournalists, um, uh, photo editors, video journalists, and other professionals in our field. Um, and she uh, has not only her own perspective as a photographer, but also um, as an industry leader here and working with a lot of other um, photojournalists. Um, so we're excited to have her lead the, the panel that we have today. So Sharice, I'm gonna turn it over to you and uh, let you introduce our panelists. Thank you, Shelley. And thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, wherever, I see we're from all over the world, so. Um, that's amazing that we're able to connect like this. Um, as Shelly said, I'm a photographer in the Washington DC area. Um, I'm the president of WAPAL and also an adjunct professor at Howard University here in Washington DC. I wanna give a special thanks to Joe Newman and Focus on the Story for hosting this very important timely panel. I'm especially interested in today's discussion as a photographer, um, can photographers protect their copyright and use social media? Personally, I use social media often to post my own stories and work, and I've connected with editors on social media. I've had photos licensed that people have, uh, they saw on my IG page. And to my knowledge, I haven't had any of my photos on IG used without my permission. I'm sure many of us have seen the story in the New York, of the New York court ruling that photographer Stephanie Sinclair gave up her exclusive licensing rights by posting on Instagram. So I know today is, is critical and very important and people are interested in hearing from our experts here today. So just to tell you who's, who's here with us today, Louis Levi. Mr. Levi is an attorney at Bell's Cats LLC, a full service intellectual property law firm he has extensive experience advising clients in the areas of trademark, copyright, unfair competition, publicity rights, e-commerce, data privacy, computer security, and online and mobile advertising, including in related licensing and contract matters. Next, we have Alan Mirabayashi, who is the chairman and co-founder of Photo Shelter, which many of the photographers I'm sure on here use. Alan is an avid photographer and frequently speaks on how photographers can use online marketing to grow their businesses. And before Photo Shelter, Alan served as a founding employee and senior vice president of engineering at hotjobs.com. We also have with us Thomas Madri. Thomas is a former commercial photographer an artist and startup CEO of multiple creative and photography related businesses. He currently is an attorney and founder of Madri PLLC. He also, his specialties, other specialties are copyright law, art law, social media law, technology law, business development, consulting and photography. And we thank you all for your time and expertise today as you're gonna help us demystify protecting our creative work when posting on social media. So with that, I'd like to um, ask Lewis to tell us a little bit more about his work with photographers and creatives and how, how you're helping them to protect their work on social media. Well, I do, um, uh, uh, there are several parts of it. One of which is simply to secure the registration. If someone has photographs published or unpublished, you know, Get them registered, get the copyright protection, which puts you in a stronger legal position to enforce. Um, and I do a lot of that work just on the sort of the early side of things before the infringement begins. I do a lot of work, um, uh, you know, enforcing images, you know, enforcing rights. You know, you find people, you find infringements all over the web of artists. I have a client now who uh, who does um, 
uh, is a, a medical illustrator, but her work is actually knocked off quite frequently. And you know, we go after them. And fortunately, she doesn't have an Instagram issue. Um, it's all from her from her her website and a licensee's website. Um, but I do a lot of that, and um, you know, help people with contracting, help people just with their 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 licensing issues. Um, a lot of it, though, is just protecting things at the front end and then enforcing when needed, uh, when people find notices of, infri you know, when people find infringements around the web, um, we, we take action as needed. And it's usually, usually resolvable, um, but it's uh, something that has to be done because you don't want to let, you know, no artist wants to let their work out there and be, uh, you know, just let everyone use it and then not enforce because then it gets to be too late. It's all out there and it's just, uh, you know, the, the cat's out of the, the cat's out of the bag, so to speak. So that's what I do generally. Okay, thank you. And Alan, um, what are you doing with Photo Shelter and how do you work with photographers um, with their work online? Uh, good morning from Honolulu, Hawaii. This is the first time I've worn a collared shirt in about two months, so <laughs> I'm on here. Uh, I have been uh, primarily an industry pundit for the for the last few years. Um, you know, when I, when I was originally uh, when we originally founded Photo Shelter as a website service for photographers, I was also the CEO. So there was a lot of day to day uh, machinations of running that business. But for the past several years, I've been the the chairman, uh, which has allowed me to sort of step back and take a look at what's happening in the industry on a number of fronts. Of course, the legal implications of being a photographer have been really challenged by social media in a lot of ways for all the great aspects of being able to get yourself out there from any place on the earth and reach a potentially large audience. Um, we've also been challenged by the legal rights that a lot of the platforms have been using. Um, so I'm in, a, in an interesting position where uh, I am not a lawyer. Uh, I know just enough to be a little bit dangerous. Um, I am also a, a, a capitalist because <laughs> I'm a venture backed fund. So, uh, you know, I believe in, in our, in the rights of companies to make money and individuals to make money. Um, but I'm also a staunch advocate for photographers and have been very outspoken on a, a number of issues in the industry. Okay. Thank you. And Thomas, um, I understand that you're a former, uh, commercial photographer. Are you still taking pictures or have you kind of left that to, um, just your legal work now and what kind of things are you doing? Yeah. I, well, uh, thank you for, for having me out today. And uh, uh, that's a, that's a question I get a lot. Why would you ever want to go uh, to law when you're a photographer? And, and uh, I understand that. Uh, absolutely. But um, I don't get to take as many uh, pictures as I'd like anymore. Every now and then we have some, uh, uh, I had an art case come in where uh, uh, my client needed pictures taken of their artwork for a legal matter. And I said, you know what, I can do that too. Uh, so every now and then I get to do that. Um, my role today uh, is to represent ASMP, the American Society of Media Photographers. They are um, 75 uh, years old this year uh, and focus on commercial photographers, commercial photography and in the industry as a whole. And obviously, we're in the middle of um, an incredible crisis in the world, and it has hurt photographers, uh, by and large, um, you know, pretty significantly. Photographers have to go places and do things. And, and so we've been trying to offer as much information as we can on COVID-19 related matters. But then in the middle of this, we had the Instagram uh, case that came out that we're going to be talking about uh, today. And um, uh, it, it brought focus back to one of the core things that photographers always have to think about, and that's their copyrights and infringement and licenses and sub-licenses. And really the question, if I post something to social media, have I just given it out to the world? And the answer isn't always you know, straightforward. And so uh, I hope we get to talk about some of that today. Um, uh, and uh, I'm, I'm very excited to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think um, now, especially with the shelter in place um, that's going on, that it's people are largely photographers are using maybe social media even more than they were before. So that being said, are there any do's and don'ts when using social media that you you all would recommend? 
um, for photographers? Yeah, I mean, um, I'll, I'll <laughs> I mean, I, I'm happy to, I'm happy to jump in and thanks. And Tom. so, um, uh, in case uh, you don't know exactly the the case we're talking about, and I've mentioned a few times, maybe I'll, I can give a little background on that for a moment, if that's okay. That's fine. Thank you. Um, so a case came out of the Southern District of New York, and uh, the case is Sinclair versus Ziff Davis. And the upshot was that a photojournalist, Stephanie Sinclair, had put images that she had taken on her public Instagram account. And uh, as a feature of Instagram, uh, users are able to embed Instagram photos onto their, their website. And the uh, online publication Mashable embedded one of Ms. Sinclair's photographs but they embedded it after they had gone to speak with her and said, hey, can we license your photograph for $50? The photographer said no. Uh, she declined to license her work for use on their website, but they embedded it into their website using this feature of Instagram because the photograph was on, uh, was on Miss Sinclair's public Instagram feed. And then the question is, is that copyright infringement? And um, without getting into all the legal intricacies at this point, um, the judge held that if you post something to your public feed on Instagram, then you uh, have agreed to Instagram's terms of use, which grants them a license to display and reproduce and do certain things with your image. And one of those certain things is to allow it to be displayed via the Instagram API and another user can then embed your image, even if you don't want them to, if it's on your public mm -hmm. feed. And so getting back to the original question, which is, um, you know, what are some do's and don'ts? I think you, uh, photographers especially have to be a little cautious right now, um, where, because it's, it's still a little up in the air, what is allowed to happen and, and what's not allowed to happen. But I, I think it's pretty clear that if you have imagery that you certainly don't want to see anywhere else on, on, on the web, but through your website or your portfolios, things like that, you probably shouldn't put it on Instagram because there is no ability short of taking your account private or taking down the photograph that can prevent people from embedding it at this point. So Thomas, uh, switching your account to private, will that so if the photographer in the case that you just spoke about miss sinclair if her page was private and someone tried to do that then it then the the court would have ruled the opposite way and she would have been protected yeah well is it simply uh, the public private thing that was a big distinction that the court made right the court said look mm -hmm. you are making your account public and therefore you're agreeing to all these things that are part of part of the Instagram terms of use. The court specifically said if the account were private and then mm -hmm. something were to have happened, it would be a much different story. The court didn't say it would be copyright infringement, but they said they made a big deal of pointing out public. And now this brings up another really interesting point, which is you can't make your profile private if you have a business Instagram or a creator mm -hmm. Instagram, you can only do that if you have a personal Instagram. Mm -hmm. And so many of our members and photographers use Instagram. They do promoted posts. They follow analytics. They're doing lots of business things and they have to have a business account, but you can't make your business account private. And so, you know, then we're talking about, well, can you archive a photo? Can you do this? And um, I'll, I'll throw in one quick thing. And I know I've, so far monopolized all the time, so I'm gonna be quiet after this, but ASMP on behalf of seven other uh, organizations, PPA, NPPA, Graphic Artists Guild, NAMPA, um, uh, a number of others, um, wrote a letter to Instagram, uh, and in that letter, I asked them for three things. And the first thing related to what we're talking about is the ability for a photographer to restrict embedding to restrict what happened in this case on a per image or account wide basis. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that would have alleviated this because then photographers could say, you know what, I want it public on my Instagram account, but I don't want people to be able to embed it. 
And that might seem like it's a lot of work, but YouTube does that with videos. Mm -hmm. You can check a box and not have your video embedded outside of the YouTube platform. And that's all, uh, that's the first thing we were asking Instagram to do. And I think a really common sense measure. Thank you. And Lewis, um, yeah. so what I have start, I've started to see is some photographers have put on their Instagram and other social media, these statements that I do not agree to the embedding of my images or the sub licensing, you know, things like that. Is, does that do anything? Does that protect them legally in any way? Or once they um, sign into the app, are they just agreeing to all those terms? Well, I think they, they've agreed, you know, like Tom was saying, you know, especially for the business, you know, for business users, they've agreed to certain terms. So, but if by putting notice on, you're certainly putting out, you're certainly putting users on notice. And one of the issues here also is the nature of the use that people are making, but it's one thing to embed in Mashable, uh, which is a sub licensee of Instagram, obviously, but it's another thing for me to come along, you know, say I'm a radio station and I want to use your image, you know, on my website, which happens quite a bit, actually. Uh, and, you know, I just take it, and if I take it from Instagram, if I, if I, that's a commercial use. You're using it to promote your business on some level. It's not clear to me at all that this company, that, the, the, that that's somehow permissible by virtue of the fact that you've embedded on Instagram. I think there's a good argument made that it's not. I mean, the decision, I think, you know, the decision's troubling, obviously, for a lot of different reasons. But I think, A, we shouldn't read it, you know, too excessively broadly. It's not like, you know, it's just carte blanche for anyone who wants to take an image off of Instagram. And the other side of it is, or the other part of it is, this is just, um, this is just a uh, one district court decision in one circuit. Uh, we haven't, you know, I don't know how far along, I don't know if Ms. Sinclair is going to appeal. Maybe Tom knows better than I do. But, uh, but uh, you know, also somebody else might bring the same case in a different circuit in California, say. And we would have, you know, maybe another decision that challenges that. Maybe they would, you know, find a way to challenge, you know, Instagram for the nature of its contract, for the nature of its term. Although, again, shrink wrap licenses and click wrap licenses have been approved, you know, have been good law for a long time and enforceable for a long time. Um, but I think that... Uh, you know, we have to take it in, in context. I think you an assertion of rights, especially if you say on your notice to go back to your original question, if you if you put on there for non-commercial, you know, that uh, you, this cannot be used for any commercial purpose or something like that, it would certainly put people on notice of what the limits are and give you, a le I, in my view at any rate, give you a leg up if you wanted to, um, hmm. you needed to enforce it, whether it, it could prevent Instagram from putting it in Mashable is one question, but whether it could take a third party, prevent a third party from, or it pr uh, discourage, is that probably a better word, discourage a third party from taking the image and using it on their commercial website is another question. And so there's probably no harm in doing it. Okay, thank you. And Alan, um, when, can you tell us a little bit more about what Photo Shelter does um you know for its members and what all that you all um just kind of do and how you are there any things or any ways you're helping to prevent theft of images when one uses um you know photo shelter so we have been writing on the topic of marketing for photographers for some time and i guess an answer to your your the question at the top of the show is what what should photographers be doing in terms of their participation with social media I think we, when we see the, you know, the, the, the newest social media platforms out there, there's a tendency to want to join them right away without really understanding or reading the terms of use. And the other aspect is we rarely ask the question of what, what are we trying to accomplish by joining these platforms in the first place? And so outside of a legal question, there's just a practical marketing question of who is your audience mm -hmm. and what does this marketing activity support? In a lot of cases, we join Instagram because it's a social platform. We want to see what our friends are doing. We want to see what people that we admire are doing, whether they're photographers or not. Um, and for some photographers, a smaller subset of photographers, they, they want to leverage their photography and their business of photography in the way that influencers and celebrities do, which is to amass as large an audience as possible. 
that is often in conflict with the goals of a professional photographer, which is to restrict access to photos and license right. them as frequently as possible. So you have this weird uh, paradigm where most of the users on, on Instagram don't really care about their copyright. They don't care about embedding because they're trying to get as large an audience as possible. There's also a set of photographers who have 250,000 and more, and they're, they're in the same boat. They're trying to create as large of an audience because they can leverage that audience to do certain things like uh, sign up for uh, workshops, um, buy prints from the photographer, et cetera, et cetera. But when you're a small town photographer with 5,000 followers, it's a much different game. And when you're funding your own photo projects and somebody rips off your, your project, um, you know, Stephanie's project, for example, Too Young to Wed, was a multi-year project to stop child brides. Mm -hmm. And she didn't want her image used for 50 bucks. Right. That is a completely reasonable ask and then Mashable turns around. So there's a moral and ethical implication here that, mm -hmm. it, that is a separate issue from the legal question. Um, mm -hmm. But so, you know, looking at the marketing side, looking at the legal side, and then seeing the disparity between how photographers want their images to be used and available to the general public is, a, is an interesting question. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And um, this is for um, any of you on the panel, but um, what about, what are your thoughts on watermarking? Um, putting a watermark on any images that you post publicly? Is that any kind of protection? I mean, I know from a, on, with like professional photographers, photojournalists, like kind of steer away from putting watermarks on things like that. It just mm -hmm. kind of cheapens it visually, but yeah. does that do anything to protect? Well, I, I'm, I guess I would say, you know, if you put a watermark on it, then you are not going to run the risk of having it um, not be known whose it is, right? But remember, uh, as Lou said, we're talking about a very specific case here where you're using the embedding feature of the API. Mm. As part of that embedding feature, and you've seen this all over the web, it has, it's like the whole Instagram window in your website. So mm. it has the name of the user, the comments, the likes, everything there. So if the big concern is that the picture is gonna end up apart from the embedding, well, that's straight copyright infringement, right? You know, that's not necessarily what we're talking about. So adding a watermark definitely helps on the copyright infringement side, because then we can trace back and as Lewis well knows, and as many of you know, you know, you get extra damages if it's willful infringement. And mm -hmm. if you have a watermark on there and someone's using it, that's a good argument that you knew it was copyrighted. But mm -hmm. I go back to my days as a photographer and I was listening to what Alan said and it's dead on there are legal questions and then there's business questions and marketing questions. And when I was a photographer, I never wanted to put a watermark on things. And, and I don't know that I would now because I do think it detracts from, from the image, but you have to realize you're taking legal risks on the other right. side. And so you have to balance those as a business owner. Can I add something there? Can I think it's sure. Um, when when you uh, you know as a photographer, and, which I am I am not by the way, um, I merely live with one. But the uh, you know there there's obviously you don't want to do anything. You don't want to put an image there that is somehow less than the original image. On the other hand, if you have a watermark on there, it's on Instagram, and you have a little note saying if you like a, a non watermarked image, please call X. Mm -hmm. That perhaps is one way around that. You know where you can so the image that's public is despoiled you know with the watermark you know is mutilated somewhat but mutilated is too strong a word but there's a watermark on it that sort of ruins the integrity of the image and then you could tell people contact me if you'd like a clean copy and pay me for it okay is that extended so when you when you're in the captioning portion on ig if you put um like a, st a disclaimer there or a statement like if you know for licensing please contact me would that be the same as putting that Would that when you talk about willful would that be the same because you have that so say i don't put a watermark on my image but i put a statement like at the top of that caption that speaks to that does that give the same protection or do you need that watermark 
on the practical side, I think from, you know, kind of what I just said, I think practically speaking, it would be better to have the watermark on the image. I mean, I think that would just because it would make it very clear your cop, you know, you copyright, if you, if you copy something that has a copyright notice on it of some sort, that's clearly a willful infringement. You should have known that this was protected under copyright that someone owned it. If you have it in a caption, even if it's in the same box, the same embed box, if it's a note above the image, there's a little bit of separation there. Alan, I'd like to know what you thought about this, actually. Uh, I'm curious to know what you're thinking. Well, you know, one of the things that we should point out, too, is when we talk about willful infringement, there's a couple of flavors of that. And when you have a visible watermark on your image and somebody uses software to either crop it out or do one of these mm -hmm. content aware fills, that's a willful <laughs> infringement um, and specifically addressed by the DMCA, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. Um, yeah. So th that's a practical reason to sort of tempt someone to try to remove that because mm. they, right. they statutory damages for that sort of activity. Um, right. It, it, in regards to you know whether you should use it from a from a business standpoint, I, I have very mixed feelings about that. I think that 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 some people um, figure out a nice way to put their logo that's effectively like a, a copyright notice in some ways. Um, but I have observed even people that put watermarks on their images. I have observed, for example, with senior portraits or sports photography, where somebody will just grab the watermark image not know any better and not and also not care that it's watermarked yeah. even though yeah. it might have you know triathlon 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 tri they'll just post it on social media anyway yeah yeah that that's true i i had um some images in a um caribbean newspaper where they just took it off of getty and they kept mm -hmm. the watermark on there and it was just on the paper with the getty watermark across it and i'm like can, can i can i i'd like to introduce because i see a comment here from david crooks um, where you say, I consider my photos an art and sign it like a painter in the lower left-hand corner. I definitely agree it would, not, it would not detract from the image on lower right. But that's, I think, you know, the copyright notice, uh, you know, the, the copyright notice that you're talking about there, I think is a bit different than the watermark. I think we need to distinguish between a watermark and the copyright notice per se. Because mm -hmm. I think watermark is something that's sort of, you know, underneath the image that says, you know, you know, Charissa May, but it's sort of back there, you know, you have whatever the image is, if it was your photo, mm -hmm. you know, you'd see behind it, Charissa May, um, you know, in some kind of like a watermark on a piece of paper. Uh, that's the way I think of a watermark as opposed to the copyright notice, because I think, Alan, you're right, you know, you remove the copyright notice, that's a manipulation of copyright, copyright management information, that's, and in, in, that's a separate basis for getting statutory damages, you know, and, uh, you know, so, you know, you shouldn't remove the notices at all, removing the watermark would be one way. Removing the copyright notice that um, David talked about, if someone were to remove his name from it, that's another removal of the copyright notice. But the watermark and the copyright notice are two different things, and I, I think it's important to distinguish them. Thank you. So what are some ways, like, I know, um, and Lewis, you talked about this, I think Thomas touched on it as well, but in terms of when you're working with your clients and how are they finding that someone took their image? Because sometimes, you know, somebody can just grab it, but mm -hmm. are there ways, are there soft, is there software, are there ways to kind of track when it's- Right, right click on Google, Google and Google search. And it says search Google for similar Im Im images. And all sorts of things turn up. <laughs> I mean, I'm laughing because I'm, I'm in the middle of a project now doing just that. And you know, you right click on Google and you find the copies. They're all, you just got to scroll down page after page and you can find them all over the world. I mean, really, it's not just in, you know, but literally all over the world. I, one of my clients, her stuff has knocked off in, in Russia and Eastern Europe and India, strangely enough, or, you know, or not so strangely enough, but it's just, you know, I find copies all over and some of them you can't do anything about because it's too far away and the process is too onerous, but it's good to know they're there. Um, parenthetically, if I could add something, just uh, really anecdotally, but a, a client of mine a long time ago said she knew her product, and this, this was a, 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 me, a Mexican media company who was sponsoring a rock and roll band down there, but they, what she always looked for when she walked into concert venues were people selling knockoffs t-shirts, and she'd like to see a certain volume of knockoff t-shirts being sold because that told her her band was popular. And so when you see your knockoffs, the other side of it is that, well, people don't like it. You know, there's, <laughs> there's the other side of it. Of course, hurtful to your business and all that, but it is a, is a gauge of popularity. 
Yeah, and I would, I mean, I mentioned there are definitely commercial services out there that, that will do searches for you. And, and I have uh, more thoughts than we have time for about, about that from the point of view of a lawyer. Uh, but one thing I always tell my clients now, I don't ask clients if they've been infringed. I ask if they're aware of infringements because mm. there's probably a lot more people who have been infringed yeah. in a lot more places than you know about. Um, and you know, it's, uh, you have to figure out how best to protect yourself, but also, you know, when it comes to finding things, the way most photographers end up finding things is one of their friends calls up and says, Hey, yeah. I saw your picture here. Yeah. That happened to me. Uh, my parents were in the, uh, in an airport in, in Japan and I got a call and, and they said, Hey, I didn't realize that you had sold some of your images to this airline. I said, well, I sure haven't, uh, ever. And so, you know, that was back in... <laughs> Back in the days before, you know, the internet and social media and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, you, you generally find those, uh, 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 you know, sporadically. You do those search image searches on Google. You hire a company to do that. But it's not a, it's not 100% for sure. Okay. Um, I just wanted to pull up. It, there was a question someone posed um, that is, is interesting. If someone has a web, a web blog, and they're focusing on photojournalism. Can they legally embed photos of photojournalists, of photographers that are available on social media, or are they running into the risk of infringement? Well, if I could just, I think if it's a web, if it's a web blog, and they're offering the photo as commentary or mm -hmm. or showing it for criticism, it's arguably a fair use. You know, if they're doing it, you know, sort of, you know, substitute just to show the image for itself in the context of the story they're writing about COVID-19 and they use someone else's photo about lines in front of a pharmacy, that's different because the photo is, you know, standing on it. You know, they're not using it for, for criticism or, or any commentary or anything like that. Alan, you, or Thomas, I'm sorry, you're, you're shaking your head, I assume. No, no, I, I definitely agree. It makes me think of the case from last year. Many of y'all probably heard about uh, Brammer versus Violent Hughes out of New York where a music festival promoter just took a photographer's image to use as background. Uh, uh, you know, it was a photo of the neighborhood where the music festival was going to be. It wasn't directly related and it was something that should have been properly licensed, uh, but wasn't. And the, the court, the lower court held that that was just fine. That was, that was okay. Mm -hmm. And then the fourth circuit, uh, court of Appeals said, no, that's not. And that was a really good win for photographers on that side. But I would say more broadly, you know, if you are a blogger, you might uh, have ad supported sites, and then it really does come down. Are you are you using it in the confine in the boundaries of fair use? But frankly, in this case, you'd probably likely be able to embed the image, even if you had ads, if you're using if you are considered a publisher. And then we start getting into the ideas, is a blogger a publisher? And that's a much, that's a different kind of question. And the answer probably is yes. And so, you know, you have to figure out, are there ads on the site? Is it fair use? Are you a licensee? Are you within the API? It, it can get confusing quick. Okay. So I, I just want to ask one last thing of all three of you before we um, go to questions um, from people who are here. Last words from each of you. Do you feel like um, that photographers should stay on social media and keep their pages public? Do you recommend that? Is it worth it? Um, Alan, from a marketing standpoint, is it worth it? And I guess you would say it depends on the audience. Um, but if you all could give some like last words or that you will want to leave, leave us with. Sure, so uh, first of all, register your copyright with the U.S. Copyright Office. Um, that is the number one thing that you should do on a regular basis. It's still a relatively affordable process. Uh, it's relatively easy to register online. Um, and that gives you added protections uh, when infringements happen. That said, this particular case um, is slightly unusual because I uh, almost certainly Stephanie had her images uh, registered with the U.S. Copyright Office. Um, and it didn't make a difference to the judge in this case. I should point out, and maybe the, the two lawyers can chime in a little bit more, that this wasn't a trial. This was a dismissal of the case. Mm. 
This was Mashable's lawyers saying, we, we think on a factual basis, there's no reason to proceed with this case. And the factual basis is Stephanie entered, uh, agreed to the terms of use of, of, of the site, which allowed us to embed her image. So there's nuance in every case. And it, it's difficult, I think, for non-lawyers like myself to understand that every case has a different set of facts. And that's why lawyers are always saying, you know, this isn't construed as legal advice. And that's why I think the best legal advice as a base protection is to register your copyright, because it just gives you a, a foundation to start your argument from that you won't have if you don't do that. So register your copyright, should you still post to social media? Uh, I, I think that we are unfortunately in an era where most of us, in order to reach our audience, whether they're professional buyers or they're people that want to buy our prints, everyone's on Instagram. And uh, unfortunately, we have to make some of these tough choices. You know, some people have suggested don't put your best stuff on Instagram. <laughs> you know, put your kind of your B-League uh, 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 images on there. Um, I, I think, you know, you have to sort of pick and choose your battles as well. Um, you know, when Mashable infringes you, that's a very different uh, uh, situation than when uh, fans of yours decide to put a, a, a blog that, that gets like 20 viewers in a year, you know, you, it's just like kids posting posters on their wall back in the day when there was no social media. <laughs> you have to know who your audience is and who's infringing you and whether it's worth to go after them or not. Thank you. It, it, it's worth just regarding copyright registration. Um, you know, you can register your published photos, you can register unpublished photos, but the Copyright Office has, uh, makes it easy to register batches of as many as 750 images uh, in one go, and the, the PTO and the copyright office fee is actually really, really minimal, fifty-five bucks or something like that. And it can be done very easily online. It's copyright.eco.gov, and you open up an account. If you, I'm sure most of you probably do that already, um, but it's um, a very easy thing to do, and it does, put, you know, it puts you in a once you have the registration, it puts you in a much stronger position. But it, it could, uh, but all the issues that Alan talked about are entirely, you know, relevant and true. Um, you still have to be careful right now about how something is used, but you can take measures to protect and, you know, putting, putting notices on, you know, make sure your copyright notices on the image, making sure that someone here said, you know, they, they have the, you know, all their fine art images have their copyright notice in the image. Um, you know, having, having it clear what the terms are for any commercial use of the image, where to license, uh, you know, and directing people to go to your website. Cause well, if it's on your website and the website says, you know, you cannot copy these or use them for any reason without permission of the of the creator, of the author, of me, basically, is, you know, cuts out all the guesswork and you you basically use Instagram and then refer them to your website where the, the full unadulterated images are available. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely agree with Alan and Lewis. I, I would just add a, a few comments and say one, you know, this is a very specific, every case is fact specific, but you're right, this was not a trial. This was a, before a trial where a judge says, uh, Miss Sinclair, your case doesn't even pass this hurdle to be copyright infringement because of these reasons, right? And so uh, I saw a note in the comments, does Instagram have anything to say about this? Well, we're hoping they respond to our letter. Although when I send a letter to uh, Instagram CEO and Mark Zuckerberg, I, you know, it, it, they might get some other mail in a day. So I hope that someone answers me at some point. I would, I would say this though, um, Instagram has supplanted websites for many photographers. You know, the, the, you know, photographers don't have websites like they did even a few years ago. And I don't think it's not a choice that a photographer should have to make. Uh, do I allow my images to be used when, like Miss Sinclair, she specifically said, no, this is not okay. Mm -hmm. But, and it was used anyway in the same context. Or do I forego Instagram entirely? And, and frankly, this is where I put on my business hat and say, no, I think photographers have to be on Instagram. You have to be where your buyers are. Mm -hmm. If you're not there, then you don't have a career. And so you just have to be uh, pretty, pretty sharp about how you go about it. I also agree with Alan putting your B-level stuff on Instagram and saying I have better <laughs> stuff somewhere else is not a, probably a good way to attract clients, right? So, um, and then uh, uh, I had one other point, but I forgot it. I'm sure it will come back. It'll come back. It'll come back around. But uh, one, one thing I want to say, Lewis, and what you said with the 
direct redirecting people to your website and the images being there and the explicit um, copyright notice there. I had heard that once before. Um, I forget where I was, some panel. And one of the panelists said something about having those, having the images on your website first and then sharing those to um, social media and leading people back. And then they could see that copyright notice. So I heard something similar, you know, to yeah. what you said it's about still, that. It's still going to, you know, you're still, you have it on your website first, you put it up on Instagram, you still have mm -hmm. the Instagram issue. So you're still, if you're a, a person, yes. You, you still have the whole embed, you know, embed terms of use policy that Instagram has, but I, you know, I still think, you know, as a legal question, if you the the more clear you are about the uh, uh, the more clear you are and uh, in, on the, in as many platforms as possible about the restrictions governing use of your work, the better off you'll be in making a case. Because again, this is a limited case. You know, we keep we keep mm -hmm. it has. To be, but there are other instances where that's going to be um, where it's it's going to be a little bit less less onerous, I would think, to prove infringement to control your rights. Mm -hmm. I the the point I forgot that I just want to make real quickly is this isn't new as of last week. These are the terms of use we all have been we all signed yeah. on to with Instagram for the last years and years and years. And so it's not like something changed this week. It's only that a court said, a court construed those terms of use to specifically allow this thing. And so I agree with what I think everyone said at the beginning, which is, you know, this is definitely a wake up call in a lot of ways, but it's also not a sky is falling type call. Our mm -hmm. big concern at ASMP is that now that this has been judicially supported, we're gonna see a lot more of the practice because I know a lot of places that might have done this in the past, but decided, no, I don't think we should because it might be copyright infringement. We'll mm -hmm. now say, ah, oh, look at this case. Now we can do that. I feel okay about it. Mm -hmm. And so it's not that there was some large shift in, in the law or in the rules or the terms of service. It's, it's that this emboldens people to, to perform right. things like this in the future. Mm -hmm. Right. Good point. Good point. Sharif, there, um, there's a question mm -hmm. I'd just like to address quickly in the chats. Uh, he, he's saying, I tried to register copyright images, but I've not gotten any word from them. They're really slow. The copyright office can be really slow. Track it on the website, you know, track it on, on their website to see what the status is. You could also call them and after a three hour hold, maybe someone will pick up. But hmm. they pick up, frankly, weirdly in the coronavirus, they actually pick up quicker now than they did before. But, um, but I think they're all working from home, so it's easier. Yeah. But you, you can follow that up. It just takes them a long time. I, I just, but, not yeah out of this flow of the conversation but i wanted to address that thank you thanks lewis so right. shelly i think this is a good time to kind of hear from, from some people with their questions yeah yeah we it is and before i'm going to take my prerogative to follow up on what lewis was just saying but once you file is it considered filed and then you don't have to wait for the response from the copyright office or do you need to that response back from them well you got to remember under copyright law um, registering it gives you uh, your copyright. Your copyright is created when pen hits paper. You know, and when in this case your you know your your photograph is is taken and and printed, okay. created. You have the right. What the registration does is gives you uh, a the right to sue in federal court. You have to have a federal registration to sue in federal court. It gives you the right to claim statutory damages of up to one hundred fifty thousand dollars per work. Um, that's what the registration does for you, but you have the right upon creation, uh, and it's important. So you don't have to wait for the registration to claim, you know, to to claim a claim a copyright. It's just how how you're able to enforce it. It depends on whether or not you have have the registration. And I'll add, I'll just add one caveat to that. There was a Supreme Court case last term that that specifically talked about this. This was Fourth Estate versus Wall Street right. com, and mm -hmm. what this said is. If you can't go into court, you can't file a lawsuit until you have the, the paper, the copyright registration, mm -hmm. but you, if you're approved, your rights are retroactive to when you apply. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the shift there was that you used to be able to file a court case if your copyright application was kind of pending, you had already filed the copyright. 
the Supreme Court said, no, you have to have that piece of paper. And if you want to get that piece of paper quickly, like Lewis said, the copyright office takes a long time, then you have to pay like 800 bucks and, and yeah. a lot more to, to get Yikes. it done. And so, but registration, I didn't mention that, super important. If anyone listens to anything that we're talking about, it's register your copyrights. Okay. Great, thank you. So I'm gonna turn now to a question from Joy Butler. Joy, I'm gonna allow oh, you, uh, I'm gonna uh, unmute you, I think, um, and allow you to ask your question. Go ahead, Joy. Oh, okay, can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Yes. Oh, so uh, my question was uh, just following up on the watermarks, whether or not the panelists had any recommendations or any uh, thoughts or ideas about digital th fingerprinting of your photos or other invisible types of monitoring? Yeah, uh, great question, question, Joy. As a photographer, I do um, embed my metadata um, before I, you know, post anything. So I do have like that di digital signature there with all of my info and copyright um, information disclaimer. And I think Lewis has something to add to that. No, I, I don't actually. Oh. Okay. I, oh, I thought I saw I you waving your hand. Joy. I know Joy. I oh. <laughs> but would that be similar to a watermark then? I, I mean, would that, does the metadata help protect? Well, I think what Joy's referring to is um, there have been a number of services over the years that, that hide uh, watermarking information that's, that's not visible to human, the human eye. Mm -hmm. The goal of those was to have this uh, computer readable watermark that couldn't be removed. And I, I use air quotes because you could remove when you do enough transformation on that image. If you rescale mm -hmm. that image beyond, you know, a certain percentage, the computer loses the ability to see that watermark. So I, I haven't been a strong proponent of them because I haven't seen the technology uh, sufficiently evolve to avoid those situations. In regards to the metadata, it's always a good idea uh, to embed your metadata in there, which includes your contact information, which includes your copyright mm -hmm. notice. The problem is that a lot of social media platforms strip that information out, mm -hmm. and you agree to that stripping when you enter into the terms of use. Normally, when somebody strips that out, that is a DMCA, another Digital Millennium Copyright violation. But when you're using these platforms, they strip them out. And part of that is a practical reason. Because when you put in a very large caption, for example, you can explode the file size um, significantly, which, which slows down the loading of that image on a website. So there are delivery practical reasons that the platforms strip out the metadata. Um, there are also uh, reasons that you might want to strip out metadata, like you don't want GPS information in there because you shot it near your home because you were in a national park and you didn't want people to find where you shot that image. Um, so again, you know, there, there's, the, um, there's the practical uh, reasons to, to use or not use this information that often conflict with the ideal reason why we want, would want to use those systems. Mm -hmm. Did I answer your question, Joy? Uh, I think she's muted. Yeah. yeah. Yes, they're responding to my question. A great answer. Thank you so much for the panel. Okay, thank great. you. All right, we also have a question from um, Andrew Prokos for um, the lawyers on the panel. Andrew, I'm going to unmute you. Uh, let's see. There we go. Well, no. Nope. No, he's muted. No, no, he's good. Go, Andrew. Oh hi! No, I thought I thought you would actually be reading the questions. I didn't. Oh, if you um, want me to, I can. But now that you're unmuted, would you like to do so? Uh, let me see if I can find my own. Uh, oh, okay. okay. <laughs> Here it is. This is my question. Um, so I submitted several questions. I'm just gonna. Are you referring to the last one that I just? Uh, the to? one about attorneys and them not willing to take cases. Yeah. So yeah. Um, actually. Uh, uh, Thomas knows me because we've we've done some work together in the past. How are you doing, Thomas? Uh, good. Uh, good to hear from you, Andrew. Absolutely. So um, my question is: In the past, I've had a really hard time having attorneys take on these types of cases because the dollar value return is typically so small, and their fair use is almost always thrown at you, whether it's a flimsy, uh, you know, argument or not. 
So a lot of times there really is no fighting back um, to these types of cases because nobody will take them on on your behalf. A lot of times they, you just have to grin and bear it. So um, one thing that I'm wondering about, do you think that the current legislation, the small claims um, copyright legislation in, in Congress that's currently stalled, um, yes. do you think that will help to kind of rectify these types of smaller claims on the part of publishers that are just grabbing images everywhere? Um, and like you guys you know, have already said, I've had many, many, many instances of publishers that grab it with the watermark put it yep. as is, use it, or even sometimes crop out the watermark, but put a text attribution, even though they never contacted me first, they never purchased the license, and they think that just attributing it to the photographer is okay without ever asking you whether they can use it. So yep. do you think that a small claims court would help um, move these cases along in any way, or is it just gonna be more of the same? Um. I'm going to jump in because ASMP for the last year, our biggest advocacy issue has been small claims copyright court. And that is currently in the Senate and it's stalled, uh, as Andrew said, and it's stalled by one senator who I would love if everyone contacted to, to ask him to release his hold on it. And that's Senator uh, Ron Wyden. Um, 99 other senators are all on board with this, but it can be held up by one person. And just to Andrew's point, in case you haven't heard about this, it provides an avenue for uh, creators who have been infringed to deal with these in low, lower level infringements on their own. Because right now, as Lewis and will attest, taking a, a case to, to federal court for copyright infringement, if you go all the way to trial, it's multi-year and multi-hundred thousand dollar. And uh, just in legal fees and time and, and experts and everything else. And so right now, Andrew, you're right. There's a, there's a chasm between if someone infringes my thing on a blog, it is, it's a violation of copyright law, but it's not, I can't go to federal court. It makes no sense to do that. One of the other reasons is even if you win a copyright infringement case, attorney's fees are not guaranteed, they're permissible. So you could go through all that, spend $300,000, win your case outright, and then still be in the hole um, quite a bit. And so that's why it's so hard sometimes to, to take on copyright cases like that. I really would encourage everyone to go to ASMP.org, click on our advocacy links. We're always messaging out, this small claims copyright court would be great for so many photographers. Can I, can I add something too? Um, there are uh, volunteer lawyer groups. I know I work with Maryland, Maryland vol uh, Volunteer Lawyers for the Arts. You help people selectively. But, you know, in terms of the cases, yes, filing a lawsuit can cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. And for somebody, for instance, using your image on a web blog or something like that, it's not worth it. And you were, even, even if you won, you wouldn't be getting the damages that you, 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 you so the, the courts don't, even if you get statutory damages, it's, you know, the courts will maybe award multiples of license fees, but they're not going to, you know, give you the top level $150,000. But I always, as of just a matter of practice, and I just did this a couple of weeks ago uh, with someone who had a, a copyright image for, for a documentary, from material used in a documentary, um, just try to, you know, call someone or to counsel them through negotiations in a very low I did, this I did on a volunteer basis, but you just sort of do it, it, it keep, it's easier to ratchet up than ratchet down. Just reach out to someone as an attorney. You know, you could reach out to someone and on the other side, try to get, you know, if it's just, that's easy. If you're trying to get some damages, well, maybe that, that doesn't necessarily have to be hard because often I find, and I've been finding this a lot where people say, you know, they weren't, they weren't necessarily intentionally infringing. They thought, well, if I put the copyright notice, it was okay. They didn't realize what they were doing was wrong. And they will immediately say, oh, yes, I agree. This person should be compensated. Um, and so there's a practical side of it. I mean, you could get all wrapped up in the legal aspects of it and filing, filing the lawsuit and whether or not damages apply and things like that. Or you can just approach somebody, even on a B2B level, and try to work it out. Or you get an attorney involved on a very low-key level so you're not talking about huge amounts of money. Of course, you got to find someone who's willing to do that. But I think a lot of people would be. You know, they're they're low. They don't have to be 
you know, major operations. They can be practical negotiations that get a solution that keeps everybody happy. Thank you. Um, and somebody posted in the questions not related. I just want to make it clear that we, um, for those who haven't noticed, uh, we are recording this webinar. I've neglected to mention that at the beginning, just I wanted everybody to know that this is being recorded. So I've neglected to say that at the beginning. Uh, we have a question from David Hutchinson. Uh, David, I am going to unmute you and allow you to ask your question live if you'd like to. Um, if not, I can ask it for you, but uh, let us know. Sure. The question is, hopefully it's not giving you feedback. Uh, if I have a website on, let's say, Photo Shelter, can I, should I do all my posting to Instagram from Photo Shelter? And that would uh, theoretically could include a watermark or copyright notice. Would there be any benefit to that? I, I, I don't know that it confers any special uh, benefit to doing it that way. I mean, if you're, you know, a lot of us are, are posting to Instagram from our phones. So from a workflow perspective, I'm always about what's the easiest. So if you're already in photo shelter and you want to post out from photo shelter, that's fine. But I often find that uh, my workflow is to use Lightroom or Photoshop. And then I airdrop the image to my phone before I post to Instagram. And then I look at it 20 times and make slight, you know, more adjustments before I post. Um, you, you're not gaining any benefit per se by, uh, uh, you know, using a photo shelter watermark versus just watermarking it in photo shelter, uh, Photoshop yourself. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. We have a question also from John Bowl. Um, John, I'm going to, uh, look for you to, um, let you ask your question live. Uh, there we go. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Thanks. Okay. Hey, how are you? Uh, I just had a question about uh, filing uh, copyright. You uh, mentioned about filing all your stuff, and I agree. But are we clear on if the images you post to Instagram, are those officially published photos? And I'm asking because I have uh, a service that files copyright of images, usually when I shoot them for clients. And if they're unpublished, then I have to do it myself. And of course, I have to bear the cost myself. So I'm <laughs> sort of curious if, if they're considered published on Instagram. And furthermore, can you just publish a whole collection like April as one collection? Or do you have to do it by post, say? You're on mute. Think you're on mute, right. Thomas. Yeah, okay. sorry, sorry. Alan, I saw you. You... Uh, smiled like I did. Do you want to talk about this issue? I, I really do. So go ahead. First, <laughs> I'll, st I'll start it and I'll pass it off. So the, the copyright office makes uh, you make a distinction between published and unpublished. Um, and in the past, it was very clear when there was no when there was no internet published was basically it appeared in a, in, in a magazine or a newspaper. Um, and then when blogs came around, there was a, a period in there, and when social media came around, there was a, a period where it was a little unclear as to whether uh, posting on your personal blog construed uh, being put in that category of published. Uh, I think um, nowadays with Instagram, it's almost certainly considered published the moment that you, po you post it to, to an Instagram, um, which would satisfy this whatever service you're using. But I, I'll, I'll let the lawyers um, contradict me or, or back me up there. Um, uh, just a, a, a short plug. We just wrote a, uh, an amicus brief um, uh, for the Supreme Court on this issue when it comes to published and unpublished through ASMP. But what I, I agree with Alan almost entirely with one caveat, and it, it actually is something that I just heard from uh, Whitney Lewandowski of the Copyright Office. She was here in Dallas and we were doing a panel. Uh, she's wonderful, by the way, and will answer so many of your questions. And I had always said, just, just like Alan did, that when you post something to Instagram, that it is considered published. Now, what the Copyright Office says is it's a distribution of copies of the work to the public um, uh, by sale or other transfer of ownership. But then there's a second part offering um, to distribute copies for purposes of further distribution or public display constitutes publication. 
there's two pieces now. This is what I believe, and I'd be interested in what Lewis has to say, because there might not be a more contentious issue between copyright lawyers than this unpublished published distinction in my mind. But there's two parts. It has to be available to the general public, which definitely Instagram is, and it has to be offered for some further sale or distribution. And so there's a weird twist there. If I am a photographer and you could hire me to take pictures like the one on Instagram, or you could buy that one, for sure it's published. But what if it's just uh, available to the public at large, but there's no indication of further sale or distribution, that would likely be considered unpublished. I'd be interested in what Lewis has to say. Well, I, I think that's the distinction, you know, with uh, unpublished, I've, I've dealt with this, you know, you deal with this all the time. If someone is not enough merely to post, in my view, and it's a matter of, you know, when I've experienced this, it hasn't been enough just simply to post something, even to hang it on a gallery wall. It has to be available for sale or for distribution somehow. Um, and so it can be, you could, it, you know, it, it seems to me you could have an image that you put on a gallery wall just for distribution, you know, just for display. But that display isn't publication. I mean, it's not, it, it's kind of confounding because it's, Publication, you think, okay, it's published, it's public, it's out there. Well, that's not what publication means in the world of copyright. It means it has to be out there for sale and distribution. You know, and I think it's, it's something that uh, has to be, you know, revisited on some level. What does it actually mean? Because people, I think, when they put it on Instagram, you think, yes, it is published. Well, it may not be, so. Well, Lu but, Lewis uh, and Tom, okay. I just had a quick question. Um, that being said, so on your website, along with your copyright statement, if you had a statement on there, like for licensing any of these images, contact me, would that be considered, would that take care of that? I, go ahead. In, in the, the, well, I, I, I definitely think that makes the, the images published, right? Mm -hmm. And if you're going to err on one side or the other, err towards published. Because, you know, if you err towards unpublished, that gives you a lot more right yeah. in court. And so if you're wrong about that, you'll get kicked out a lot quicker than you will if you err on the side of publish. But this is really, this is a big gray area in terms of what exactly, remember, we're still working under the Copyright Act of 1976. Mm -hmm. Okay, we've updated it occasionally, but, you know, this is not, the copyright laws were not written with Instagram in mind. Yeah. Well, it's also worth noting that they started the revision when they got to the 1976 Act. They had been working on that since about 1959 or 60. It took 15 years. And over the last few years, I think this is true, right? And in the last yeah. few years, they started an effort to rewrite the copyright law. But, you know, I hopefully will see it before I die. But I don't expect anything quick. I, I really don't. Okay. Great, thanks everybody. Uh, we have a question from Rodney, who's uh, based in Ghana, and uh, he has a oh. question he'd like to ask that is relevant to a lot of our international uh, attendees. Hello, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. yep. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, first off, thanks for this. Um, I was very excited when I saw it come up. So my question is, um, as a photographer from and in Ghana who produces work for global organizations, can I use the US Copyright Office to copyright my work as well? I, I don't know. I mean, the publication isn't isn't publication in the United States. Um, it's publication anywhere. Publication, as we've discussed it. So right. you, you seek a registration in the U.S. What it, it gets you is you know the right to to sue in the U.S. and all of that. Um, yeah, I don't see why not. So you yeah, would say it, I should. I'm sorry. Well, uh, Tom. Oh no, sorry, I, I, I was going to. I was going to say, remember, there's, you know, um, there's a lot of international treaties, this, this Berne Convention idea that the U.S. signed on to in 89. And essentially what it says is that if you're a member of this treaty, and I think it's 183 countries that are members, then if there's an infringement in another country, um, you're at least given the rights of your home country. And there's some minimums that you have to be given the rights to, right? And so, you know, one thing is tr uh, copyright's not like trademark. Trademark, you have to go register in every country you might be doing business in and there's separate registrations and everything else. If mm -hmm. you register in the U.S. and it's then uh, infringed somewhere else around the world that's a member of this, uh, the Berne Convention Treaty, 
then you know you will uh, you will probably have to hire a lawyer in that country to deal with it because it will be under those laws. But the idea is that copyright is portable in a way that trademarks are not. Right. Okay. Uh, Tom, it, isn't it correct though that to bring a suit in the US, it still has to be registered, even if it's a burn, even if it's under uh, protected under burn? Mm. Yeah, yes, yeah, and, th and that was, and sorry if I wasn't clear on that, that was one of the upshots of, um, of the, uh, uh, the case, that Wall Street case, was that you have to have that actual registration before you go in. And many countries will have that distinction. The, the, the idea, though, is that every member of the treaty, their copyright laws are, give you a minimum level of protection wherever right. you are. And so if you found an infringement that you wanted to take on in another country, then you, know, you would want to register anyway, and any lawyer you had over there would do that. We've had to bring some cases in England and Australia and other places, and then you know, we've had to, to do that kind of process, but yeah. Okay, great, thank you. Um, thank you. A, a thank you very thing. much. You wanna, thank you, you Rodney. Wanna, yeah, thanks, Rodney. Did you want to say something on that, Sharice? I didn't want to cut you off. Oh, no, no, no. I was just okay. thinking, Rodney, for okay. all the way from Ghana. Ghana. <laughs> yeah, thanks for being on. Uh, a question from an anonymous uh, questioner, um, and this is about reposting. So if some, you post something on IG and then a client or someone else then repost it, and then that repost is then embedded somewhere else by someone else, what, what are the implications there? So uh, as a practical matter, when you find a repost that you didn't authorize, Instagram does have a process to take down that image. It's part of their DMCA process. Um, and they're actually really good about it. Um, and it usually takes anywhere from 24 to 96 hours to remove that repost. Mm -hmm. uh, if the repost goes up and then it's embedded, I'm not qualified to answer that question. So I'm not <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I would I would say remember there's kind of what it, it the judge held in this case, for example, that the what Mashable did in the embedding was allowed under this idea of sub sub license and you know that kind of thing. But let's say someone then went to Mashable site and you know screenshotted the picture and used it somewhere else. Well, that's clear copyright infringement, right? And and so you know it really depends on. Are things reposted? Are things done in a certain way? And you got to think about the embedding because if if I as a photographer, let's even say I'm okay with embedding, but then one day I decide to take down my photograph, well, that removes it from everywhere it's been embedded. So that's why that's an, that's one of the reasons why this seems more okay than if someone just takes it or right clicks it or or uses it in a different way because if that happens then if you take it off your Instagram, it still lives on out there and that's a different case. So. Okay. I just and, want to make a, yeah. a very short plug, you know, we're all constrained financially nowadays and, and there's a lot of people who have never joined trade organizations or let their memberships lapse. And mm -hmm. I will say uh, that ASMP and NPPA uh, in particular have been incredible organizations for advocating for photographer rights and representing you as a photographer and a, and a creative uh, in the court system, in the judicial system in, in, in the US. And if nothing else, you should not wait until these issues crop up to support these organizations because they're doing work on your behalf on almost a daily basis, whether mm -hmm. it's the rights of press journalists or whether it's these uh, claims court uh, uh, issues that are coming up you know, uh, a, a few hundred dollars a year to protect your interests is a lot better than having to deal with an individual lawyer to in, uh, protect your interests. Mm -hmm. uh, I, if I could just for a moment, thank you, Alan. And, and as a representative of ASMP, we have tried so hard right now to, to help all photographers through these things. In fact, I was just looking that um, 37 minutes ago, Trump signed the bill that uh, funds more of the uh, Stimulus Cares Act, uh, mm -hmm. including the Paycheck Protection Program and the EIDL. And in this afternoon, we'll be doing our sixth town hall at ASMP that's totally free. Last week, I sat there and answered questions for two and a half hours on these issues and every week before that. And 
every one of you, if you make money from your photography and your photography, you haven't been able, this has affected your business, which I think is almost everyone, you should apply for the EIDL and you should apply for the PPP. This is designed for independent photographers, sole proprietors, independent contractors, self-employed people. This is not just for companies and you need to do that and go to ASMP, see all the articles we've written, watch the videos. And really we would love your support because we're trying to work really hard to protect you. And thank you, Alan, for that. We really appreciate it. Um, we're getting uh, close to getting to one of the last couple questions here. So I'm going to uh, call on Greg Smith to ask a question about watermarks and proper notice. Um, so Greg, are you, uh, not yet unmuted, sorry. Uh, there it goes. There we go. Um, I, uh, have always understood that if you're going to give a copyright notice, it has to be in a specific form in order to be, uh, viewed as proper notice for willful infringement. Um, could you describe that form? Um, uh, my understanding was it had to include the year of uh, either first publication or creation uh, registration uh, in order to uh, be legitimate as well as either the word copyright or the copyright symbol. Not a C, not a C in parentheses, none of that stuff. Does that make a difference? Well, the, co the copyright, no, the formalities were sort of lifted in the 76 Act, but you, you should, um, and if the copyright notice, it's useful to have it just the standard way with the copyright symbol. And then in the copyright symbol, then the year, the year of creation or year of publication, and then the name of the owner. Um, I think, I don't, I don't believe at this point that your ability to have uh, damage is contingent upon the copyright notice. I'm, I, Tom, I'm, 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 I'm forgetting something here, Thomas. Is that um, no, no, uh, yeah, the copyright um, notice required at this point or no? I don't think it is. Right, there's kind of two sides of this. And one is right. one of the big things in the 1976 copyright law was that you no longer had to put notice on your works in any way to get all of the protections of copyright. Now that's slightly different from this idea of wanting to support additional damages. And in the courts, different courts have actually come out in different ways on this, but in the courts, there's this presumption and the presumption is that if you have an official copyright, you know, uh, a statement that's, you know, the copyright symbol, the year and your name, and that is removed, that really does support additional damages. Um, but you do not have to have that to gain all of the uh, benefits. It just is like, it helps you get over the first hurdle a little bit. Uh, and as far as the form, uh, no, I have, uh, I don't believe you can use a C in parentheses, you can not use a symbol at all, that kind of thing. Now, again, this is an area where I have seen different courts come out different ways on it, but the underlying rule and what the copyright law says is that you do not have to have notice to gain all the benefits of, of copyright law. The idea with willful infringement is a little more fact specific, but. Great. I'm going to ask, uh, just uh, combine a couple questions. So first of all, does everything that we've been talking about has been specific to Instagram, but since they're all owned by the same owner, uh, as Facebook, do, are, are the same concerns uh, at, on Facebook as well? What, that ca question came in in a couple different formats. And then um, could you also clarify, and, and we've talked about this, but it just maybe make it super clear that if you've registered your images with the Copyright Office and then you post on Instagram, which then means you're agreeing to the terms and conditions of Instagram, what's the nexus there between your registration and then agreeing to the terms and conditions on Instagram? Most of the social media platforms have an embedding function. Mm -hmm whether it's Snapchat or Instagram or Twitter or YouTube, uh, they all allow you to embed. Uh, even though Facebook and Instagram are owned by the same parent company, Facebook, the terms of use are different for both platforms. So you really have to examine uh, and look for differences. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, um, this is this was very Instagram specific, but uh, and Facebook is different. Facebook doesn't have the same type of embedding procedure and the API and that kind of thing. So that wasn't touched here, even though that Facebook owns Instagram. But to the bigger point, and I saw this in the comments and the questions. Well, when I sign up for Instagram, I agree to the terms of service, but I don't agree to this idea of the platform policy that's mm -hmm. over over here. But in the terms of service, it says you kind of agree to the platform policy. Mm -hmm. And one of the big issues and the second thing we asked Instagram for in that letter was to clarify and simplify their terms of service and their platform policies. Because right now, you when you, uh, when you sign up for Instagram, you're agreeing to four or five different things and three of them you're not even looking at. You don't have to physically agree to. By agreeing to the first one, you're kind of agreeing to the others. Now, the question is, is that accurate? And the answer is, I, I, that's a great area that I hope Ms. Sinclair and her lawyers, and we've been talking about this with them, you know, we're gonna be supportive to figure out, does that work? What I just said is what the judge said in mm -hmm. the last thing, but is that actually the, the law or the way it should be? I don't know. That feels like a ripe area to to attack in this case. And and I think you see if it moves forward, there's going to be a lot more talk about the terms of use issues than there are about some of the other things we've discussed from a legal side. It's worth noting there, too, in the decision, even the judge wrote that that was a bit it was less than ideal to have them in two separate places, which was an yeah. important little bit of dicta in there. OK. Um. So yeah, so we had another question here, and then this is that has been discussed, but I think um, a little bit of clarification was asked, and I'm going to turn to Spring Hansen. Spring, I am finding your name right now to allow you to ask your question. Uh, Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. So I just wanted to be clear because if you said that Sinclair because they used she had it posted on her public instagram page does that mean that the images on our business instagram page are protected or not i just i just want to be clear with that sure i'll i'll dig into this because first of all if you go to asmp I've, I've now written three articles trying to really drill into this so here's the deal you it's you have public and private which are options for your personal Instagram account. If you have a personal Instagram, it can be public or private. If you have a business or a creator account, it can only be public. You cannot have a business or a creator account that is private. Therefore, if, you, if your account is private, that means you have a personal account. But if you're a business who relies on analytics and things, and you're a photographer who wants to know the traffic and everything else, you can't do that from your personal account. So there's a real catch 22. But to specifically answer your question, businesses cannot have private accounts on Instagram. You would have to downgrade to personal and then turn private. And that's another thing that is a concern. Okay, all right, I, I understand that now. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And just quickly, um, uh, Rosario um, was asking Thomas, does a ASMP um, help and support photographers in Puerto Rico as well? Yeah, absolutely. And really, and this was something that the ASMP board, um, uh, I heard uh, the other day at a board meeting, and it was, we're in the middle of, of such a crazy time that right now, ASMP membership is every photographer. And I, they don't care where you are and I don't care where you are. We are supporting the industry right now because the industry is hurting like you, you couldn't believe, right? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, almost everything that we have done in the last six to eight weeks is totally free on our website. There's probably, if you really wanted to watch it, 20 to 30 hours of me talking about stuff up there that you can hear from. And so, you know, everything right now we're trying to make open to support the industry because this is a time it needs support. Do we have members all over the world? Absolutely we do. And we absolutely support photographers in Puerto Rico. Okay, great, thank you. Um, I have a question here from Katerina Kojic. Um, she's asking uh, some additional questions around, you've modified a photo. So Katarina, I just unmuted you. 
Hi. Um, so I wondered if you, you know, like if you used to print before, uh, well, I actually don't know the answer to this in, in the old days either, but my question is if you um, have an image that you have posted to Instagram, let's say, and then, and that one you have copyrighted, and then later you go back and you want to repost it, but you do some filters or you make some changes and then you repost it. Is that considered the same image because it's based off of an original or are those considered now different images? Lewis, do you want to talk about derivative works? Oh, you're muted. I'm mute. Mm -hmm. Unmute. There, sorry, sorry. Um, is it, are you the same image, image that you're reposting or have you modified the image? No, I'm saying it would be a modified image or, you know, is there a level of modification that would make it considered a totally different image? Well, if I understand the question properly, I mean, if, if you're taking a basic image and then modifying it in some way and then posting it somewhere, well, that's a derivative, a derivative work that you had the right to create. So the underlying work, you know, would that element of it would still be um, uh, protectable if, if you registered the original work, that registration would still apply to the derivative work in terms of enforcement. But if you wanted to create the protect all the additional changes that you made, then you could register, you know, you, you would, uh, and if they were significant enough, you'd want to, I would think as a precaution, you'd want to register the new work and in it, you'd claim that there's pre-existing work in it and identify the registration number that it's covered by. Mm -hmm. And is there a level, I mean, like, is there a certain level of change that needs to happen for it to be really derivative? Like, is just increasing contrast, for instance, or pumping up saturation slightly, making it a derivative, or is it really just the same image? I, I think it has to be a bit more. I, I, I'd be interested to know what, what Thomas and Alan thought of this, but I, I would think uh, it would have to be a bit more than simply changing the level of contrast or something like that. It would have to be maybe, you know, something more, the cropping in a different way, cropping in or out a figure in it, so, something that really substantially changes the image uh, as opposed to just a change in shading. But, you know, Alan and Thomas, you guys might disagree. I'm wondering. No, I I definitely agree. I you, it's been my advice to my client. And first of all, you can tell already that what makes the derivative work is another gray area, right? But mm -hmm. uh, if you're a photographer and you own a copyright on an image and you're changing the contrast and you're changing things that you would normally do, and you know, uh, you do not, in my opinion, uh, generally need to uh, uh, file for an additional copyright. That is within the scope of a derivative work for sure. Now, if you're taking pieces of that work and merging it with pieces of another uh, image that you have, you're doing, you're creating what amounts to a new work, then your new work needs to be, um, needs to be registered separately. But I mean, short of huge, huge changes, mm -hmm. I, I feel pretty confident in saying that that all falls under a derivative work and you don't need to re-register. As a non-lawyer who sort of observed the, the legal space of photography, the reason why there's a lot of ambiguity is because there's not a lot of what, what they call settled case law on this stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the law works on precedent. So when, when there's an actual trial with an actual judgment, it's easier to say that this was enough of a transformation so that it should have been registered as a derivative work. Otherwise, we're left sort of interpreting based on mm -hmm. the ambiguity of the law. Um, mm -hmm. And that's what makes it very, very difficult. And, and the majority of, of copyright infringements that lawyers take on are often settled out of court. So even though they've been uh, mm -hmm. addressed in terms of a, a, a legal suit being filed, we never actually get a final judgment from, uh, from the, the legal establishment. Mm -hmm. It reminds me of that, that case with the um, illustrator who used the Obama photo from Associated Press mm -hmm. and created that whole logo that was essentially used as the uh, campaign and, right. you know, got in trouble for. Yeah, and, and, you know, that to me, of course, I tend to side with 
with uh, photographers on a lot of these issues on the copyright uh, type side. And, and this is an area where copyright, uh, where photographers and artists diverge, right? Mm -hmm. Appropriation art is something where, you know, you want to take things and it's not copyright infringement. Everything's fair use, right? And photographers are much more protective and, and they say, no, you can't use, I mean, just look at Richard Prince and those type right. of cases. But, you know, uh, specifically to that, if it's my photograph and I'm making the work that might be a derivative work, it's really likely to be, it's yours. It's not, you know, mm -hmm. it's really likely. Will this change the case law from being, if the case law gets passed, will that make less gray areas? Yeah, absolutely. You know, um, last term the supreme court took up two copyright cases which was lovely because they don't take a ton of cases a year we'd like to see them um, put some more nuance on things there's a case that people probably aren't going to pay much attention to and that's google versus oracle which is a case about computer coding and apis but the reason this is important is it's the first case to discuss fair use in 25 years and what the Supreme Court decides in this weird computer code case is going to have huge implications for photographers. And um, you can take a look at an amicus brief we were involved in uh, in the uh, in the Oracle case uh, over at ASMP and figure out you know that's gonna that's gonna be resounding. And so yes, we want more case law. Obviously, we want good case law. Not every case should go to the appeals courts because if they rule against you, well, then it's settled law in a negative way. So you need to pick and choose your, your battles. Okay, thanks a lot. We're getting ready. We need to wrap up soon, but I wanted to just end, um, Sharice, if it's okay, if asking mm -hmm. Alan to give us, what's your um, protocol for, if you're gonna post something on Instagram that you really like, what are you gonna do with that photo and what protections are you gonna take before you post? I mean, ideally, you would register your copyright before you, you publish to any social media. Uh, again, I just think it affords you a, 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 an added layer of protection. I think in practice, you know, we get so excited when we take a good photo that we want to post it immediately, and that, unfortunately, is just kind of human nature. Um, you know, whether I, I would agree with, with Thomas in terms of we almost don't have a choice um, and I made the analogy in, in a piece that I wrote that it's sort of like being in business back in the 70s and 80s without having a listing in the yellow pages. Mm -hmm. of, of course, you can do it. And if, you know, if a lot of your business is coming from word of mouth, that, that, that's one way to operate your business. But for the rest of us, we need the added benefit of having this marketing engine called Instagram or Facebook or Twitter for people to follow us and then get updates when they, every time they, they check their phone. So I, I don't know that there is a, a best practice that I would recommend. I think that if you've been infringed a lot and you haven't been successful in the courts, then by all means, get off of social media. Um, but otherwise, I think that, you know, joining the trade organizations and having them advocate on your behalf. And I think, you know, when ASMP and the other trade organizations write to Mark Zuckerberg um, at Al about allowing an embed function, that's, that's a a cause that we as an industry should rally around. And, you know, if, if Thomas says the best way to, to support that is to do a letter writing campaign or ch start a change.org petition, then we should follow the trade association's lead and, and, and lend them our support. Okay. And we have the links to that, um, to the Senator Wyden um, uh, letter and how to contact in the chat. So anybody who's mm -hmm. listening can look for that there. We'll try to also post it on the Facebook page. Um, it is time to wrap up. Sharice, any final comments from you before I wrap up? I just wanted to say thank you to Alan, Lewis, and Thomas um, for lending their expertise and their time in, in helping us through this because I know I had a lot of questions personally um, with posting on social media and how I could protect myself. So I feel better and stronger in, you know, how to move and, you know, maybe some things I'm going to implement a little differently. So I, I appreciate you all. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Shelly. Mm -hmm. And a special thanks to Joe and Focus on the Story for hosting this very important uh, panel. I, I learned a lot. I think other people got a lot from it just looking at the chat. And yeah. just thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah.
Great. Yeah, and we want to thank the organizations that have made your everyone's participation here possible. American Society of Media and Photographers, uh, WAPAL, uh, Bell's Cats, Photo Shelter. Thanks everyone for for your support. We also have um, sponsors that have been helping us uh, keep this uh, virtual photo festival going: Fujifilm, Multiple Exposures Gallery, Peak Design. Tamron and the Capital Photography Center. Uh, I do want to give a shout out for people to put on their calendar our next webinar, which will be on May 1st at noon. Um, it's going to be a visual history of hip hop. It's going to be fantastic. Um, so put that, uh, be sure to register for that. Um, thanks everybody for participating. Um, we will have uh, the recording available on Facebook um, as well as some additional links. Thanks everybody for your active participation. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm.